Welcome to today's webinar sponsored by the Chicago DOE Alliance Center. Today I have the honor of introducing a friend and colleague, Paul Steinhardt, as today's speaker. Paul is the Albert Einstein Professor in Science at Princeton, where he's on the faculty of both the Departments of Physics and of Astrophysical Sciences, and a member of the Princeton Center for Theoretical Science, which he co-founded in 2007. Paul's research is rem remarkably diverse, spanning problems in particle physics, astrophysics, cosmology, condensed matter physics, and geoscience. He's well known as one of the original architects of the inflationary model of the universe and later the concept of cyclic cosmology. He's also known for his work in dark energy and dark matter. Paul has had a long standing interest in novel materials and disordered forms of matter. Work that led to his development of the theoretical concept of quasi crystals with a student of Levine in 1983. Based on Penrose tilings, this re revolutionary concept for condensed matter was established experimentally about the same time by Dan Schechtman and his colleagues. And Paul's subsequent work showed the importance of extreme conditions in the synthesis and stabilization of quasi crystals in experiments that also involved in a small way our, a collaboration with our group. In 1999, Paul launched an ambitious search for quasi crystals in nature, work with Luca Bendi and others that led to the discovery of the first quasi crystal in mineral in 2009 and a second one in 2015 in meteorite samples from Kamchatka. He's also the co inventor of icosahedral platonic quasi crystals and has discovered new classes of platonic materials. Given Paul's many accomplishments, it's not surprising that he has numerous honors and awards, including membership of the National Academy of Sciences, the Dirac Medal, the Oliver Buckley Prize, and the Aspen Italia Prize with Luca Bindi, to name just a few. His BS is from Caltech, and his master's and PhD are from Harvard. So today's talk is the most recent chapter in his hunt for quasi-crystals one that takes us to the site of the Trinity test at Alamogordo and synthesis by a rather different means, a nuclear blast, as you can see. So Paul, we're really delighted you are taking time to give this talk. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, it's a pleasure. So I'm going to be trying to give today an overview of the entire story of quasi-crystals from, from beginning to end um, that uh, Russ briefly summarized. Um, it, we, in settling the title for this talk, I tried to make a title since there wasn't an abstract to go along with it. I tried to make a title that described pretty much what we'll be covering, uh, working, working it out with Russ. But if you had asked me for what title I would naturally give this, this uh, talk, it would be something more like uh, what it's not wanting to give me. Okay, this, uh, the improbable search for the impossible because uh, this is more than the story about science, it's also a science story, how science got done. And, and it's such an unusual story, along with the unusual science, that I think it's worth telling both at the same time. And you'll see what I mean by improbable and impossible. There'll be improbable twists and turns occurring over and over again, and impossible barriers to overcome, and all kinds of interesting sidelights along the way, that one has to encounter in order to make progress uh, in this subject. So some of the examples of uh, things that had to be encountered along the way are a super, are, um, let's see, now this thing is just not advancing for me. Try it this way. Our super plumes, um, we had to find a missing Dutchman. There was Tim the Romanian, there were smugglers, there's KGB agents, bears, lots and lots of bears. We had to involve some cannons and, and even a plutonium gadget along the way. And so while this subject uh, at various, and this story at times will seem a little crazy, why were these people working so hard to, to make progress? Um, why were they sticking to the subject even though at various times there would seem to be these impossible barriers? My simplest answer to that question is, imagine that someday you were involved in some sort of research subject which involved subjects, which involved topics like the ones on this list here. Uh, once, you, once you started, how could you ever let go of such a subject? 
So that is really what was driving us, a combination of science, scientific curiosity, and also sort of going all in after a certain point and chasing after this subject, given all the strange encounters and, that we had along the way. But let's begin with the basics of the subject itself, the idea of quasi-crystals. So the idea of quasi-crystals was first introduced to the broad uh, science community in 1984 uh, as a combination, as a result of a combination of a, an experimental discovery and a theoretical discovery. The experimental discovery was of a material synthesized in a laboratory consisting of roughly six parts aluminum, one part manganese, made by rapid quenching from a liquid. And uh, what Dan Schechtman and his colleagues, Elon Black, Vinny Gladius, and John Kahn discovered was this, this strange material produced diffraction patterns. Um, when you did it, when you tried to make an electron diffraction pattern, made electron diffraction pattern that diffracts electrons like a crystal but with a symmetry that's impossible for crystals. So on the right is the diffraction pattern which they reported. And if, as you look at it, at first you might think it's crystalline because it contains what appear to be sharp spots. But if you look more closely, you notice those sharp spots for, form rings, tenfold rings. And you look further into the pattern, you might even notice it's full of pentagons, which means that you're looking down an axis of five or tenfold symmetry. And five and tenfold symmetry were symmetries that were famously known to be forbidden for crystals. That was Schechtman, what Schechtman noted. This is something that shouldn't be. They didn't really have an explanation for it. They knew that crystals are, by definition, periodic materials in which atoms or groups of atoms form building blocks that repeat periodically with regular spacing. They knew, because it had been known for over 100 years, and proven rigorously mathematically that if you have a periodic structure, there's only certain rotational symmetries that are possible, whether it be a three-dimensional solid crystal or even just a two-dimensional tiling. Let's consider the case of tilings. If you want to make a periodic pattern, you know you can make it a pattern with square symmetry out of squares, triangles, you can make rectangles, you can make a periodic pattern with parallelograms or with hexagons. And you might think the list at first goes on forever, but what we've all learned is that a fundamental property of mathematics and crystals is that there's only certain symmetries which are possible in two dimensions. These are all the possible symmetries. In three dimensions, things get a little bit more complicated because you can have different symmetries along different directions, but there's only a certain finite number of combinations. In two dimensions, some, an example of something that's completely forbidden is five-fold symmetry. Try tiling your bathroom floor with pentagonal tiles and you'll rue the day because you'll have those inevitable cracks, those regions that can't be filled in and uh, that won't work well. So this is strictly forbidden, but not only is this forbidden, so it would be seven-fold symmetry, 11-fold symmetry, 117-fold symmetry. There are an infinite number of forbidden symmetries and only a handful of symmetries which are allowed. And the analog uh, in three dimensions is the same, similar, uh, those, uh, except for those symmetry, except for that limited list of symmetries. If you look at a crystal along any single direction, uh, along any single axis, it can, it's also forbidden to have anything other than this limited number of symmetries. So, one of the things I remember learning uh, when I first opened, cracked a book on solid state physics and the opening pages is that the most famous forbidden symmetry for solids is the symmetry of an icosahedron. Icosahedron is a platonic solid shown on the right there, made of 20 identical triangular faces. It has identical edges and identical vertices. It also has the same symmetry as a soccer ball. So you can think of it as a soccer ball. But the important point about it is, is that it's full of five-fold symmetry axes. It has six independent ones. They would correspond to axes running through the centers of opposing pentagons in my soccer ball. So this is not just once forbidden, but it's six times forbidden. It is the most forbidden symmetry for a solid, or was thought to be. Because in fact, when Schechtman and his colleagues rotated their sample at, along different axes, they discovered that it had exactly this symmetry, the symmetry of an icosahedron, the most forbidden symmetry of all, 
Fortunately, an answer was waiting in the wings. For several years, my student Dove Levine and I had been hypothesizing or exploring a hypothetical possibility of a new form of matter that we called a quasi-crystal. The idea was to see if we could make forms of matter which violated the, the laws of symmetry by relaxing the condition that one has periodic order and replacing it with the idea of quasi-periodic order. Now, in English, the term quasi-periodic has the unfortunate characteristic that it gives the notion to most people that it means sort of periodic. Uh, mathematically though, that's not what it means. It means it's actually a discrete sum of periodic functions where the ratios of the periods are an irrational number. So it means something rather specific and predictive. It's a predictable pattern. You can write down a formula for it. It's just not expressible in terms of a single periodic function. And what we showed is that if you relax the rules from periodicity to quasi-periodicity, symmetries that were impossible for crystals are now possible for quasi-crystals. In fact, every symmetry that's impossible for crystals, an infinite number of them are now possible, uh, that were forbidden for, possible for crystals are, for, are allowed for quasi-crystals. Our inspiration for uh, this idea was uh, Penrose tiling which I imagine that many or perhaps all of you are already familiar with, but especially if you're not familiar with it, you might take a look at this example of a Penrose tiling here. It can take many forms, but this is one that's composed of two different tile shapes, a fat rhombus and a skinny rhombus. Now, especially if you're seeing it for the first time, take a moment and ask yourself, am I looking at something which is ordered or disordered? If you have the impression it's ordered, it's probably because you notice there are certain repeating motifs. But if you try to predict the repetition or what will happen next in the pattern, you might find that you're, that, that you're uh, are unable to figure out what's going to happen next. So maybe it's disordered. The answer is, is that it's neither periodic nor is it disordered. It is perfectly well-ordered, but in a quasi-periodic fashion. This, by the way, is something that was not known to Penrose when he made the pattern. He had a completely different line of reasoning for making the pattern. He didn't realize that hidden in the pattern was a quasi-periodicity. He knew it was non-periodic. He knew what it wasn't, but he didn't know what it was. To see what it is, it's useful to uh, label the fat and skinny tiles with these little line segments, which, which I'm showing on the right. So imagine I pull them out, I label each of them with those line segments and I put them back into the tiling again. If you do that, you find that you can arrange things so that those little line segments line up, join on to one another as you go from tile to tile to form straight lines that run through the entire tiling. So if you had the impression that you were looking at something disordered, you now realize actually you're looking at something which is highly ordered because the moment I place a single tile down, which has in it a, com a combination of five line segments, it immediately enforces a whole line of tiles going out to infinity in either direction. Furthermore, I notice that the lines that I form are this, there are five of them, and they're the same in all five directions. So if I wondered, am I really looking at something with five-fold symmetry? I might think that because I see these motifs with five-fold symmetry. I now have no doubt because I can see they're, construct, they're related to these lines, which definitely have five-fold symmetry because there's five equivalent parallel line sets uh, along each of the edges, aligned along each of the edges of a, of a pentagon. Now, if I look at the lines along any one direction, I see, oh, there's actually something rather special to these pattern of lines. First of all, there's only two spacings that you can have, either a long or a short. And I, if I calculate their lengths, I find the ratio of those lengths is not some arbitrary number, it's the golden ratio. One plus the square root of five divided by two, or 1.618 dot, dot, dot. So very special in, in that sense. And then furthermore, if I follow the sequence of long and short intervals, long, short, long, short, long, long, short, et cetera, I might think at various points, it's about to settle into some regular repeating pattern but I find that the pattern always breaks. 
And as I study it more carefully, I find that as I go along, the ratio of the number of long lengths to the number of short lengths follows the golden ratio. I'm sorry, follows a ratio of Fibonacci numbers, which approaches the golden ratio. In fact, it's the most rapid approximate to the golden ratio. And that means that this sequence is very special. It's expressible as a sum of two periodic functions where the ratio of the periods is the golden ratio. It is quasi-periodic. That's how we discovered that the secret behind the Penrose tiles is its quasi-periodicity. And that explains how you can have five-fold symmetry because you violated one of the laws of crystallography. And yet you can still have something which is well-ordered. Now, in fact, the moment you know it's quasi-periodic, you know a lot of things about it mathematically. You know, for example, you can obtain any quasi-periodic pattern as a projection from a higher dimensional periodic function. So for example, you can obtain a Penrose tiling as a projection from a higher dimensional hypercubic lattice. You also know that its diffraction pattern is point-like or Bragg-like, something which is taken for granted now that quasi-crystals are well known. But at the time, the lore was the only kinds of materials can have Bragg diffraction or crystals. That's not true. There's an infinite number of different pattern, quasi-crystal patterns that can also have Bragg peaks. And you also now have the secret for developing patterns with other symmetries, symmetries other than fivefold. Like here, for example, is the case of a sevenfold symmetry pattern. And here's one with 11 fold, and here's one with uh, 17 fold. And what was most interesting to us was that you could also make patterns with the most forbidden symmetry of all, the three-dimensional icosahedral symmetry. So here are building blocks, or you'll see there are four colors here, four different shapes, which comprise the building blocks for a three-dimensional icosahedral pattern. Now, these particular building blocks have a special property. They don't, they not only have the property that they can form a quasi-crystal pattern, but because they have those special joins, those Lego-like joinings on the edges, the only way you can put these, these blocks together without leaving space in between is to form a quasi-crystal pattern. That is to say, they force the pattern. As I build the pattern from more pieces and build layer after layer, I can build, I can fill the entire room, I can fill the entire universe if I had enough of them with these, with these blocks. Um, I can only pattern, the only space filling pattern I can form is a, a icosahedral quasi-crystal pattern. And that was important for Dove and Mike's thinking because it meant that in principle that you could have materials in which the intermolecular or interatomic interactions, if they mimic the joining rules of these blocks, would be forced to form a quasi-crystal. Not just that they could, but they wouldn't have a choice. It would be a stable state of matter, or at least a long-lived metastable state of matter. And we had even computed the diffraction pattern. Uh, that you would get from such a material as you look down, let's say, the five-fold symmetry axis of the icosahedron, and we show that the pattern um, is the pattern on the left. And we had actually had that pattern computed on my desk when a colleague of mine visited one day uh, and had a preprint of a paper by Schechtman et al. showing the pattern on the right. And it didn't take more than a second to recognize that the pattern on the right is closely related to the pattern on the left. And that is essentially how the subject of quasi-crystals was born, the realization that a possible explanation for what Schechtman had found, this icosahedral material, was that it was an example of a quasi-crystal. Now, the actual history of the subject didn't go as smoothly as that. Some of you who were around at the time may recall that originally, in the first few years of the subject, the idea of quasi-crystals was rather controversial. Uh, various alternative models were proposed, most famously by Linus Pauling. Uh, Linus, in fact, at one time made the remark that there's no such things as no such things, no such thing as quasi-crystals, only quasi-scientists. So an example of a quasi-scientist, I suppose. Uh, now one of the reasons why he could get by with such a remark initially is that Schechtman's material, as nice as the pattern on the right may look, actually isn't that perfect. If you look at the diffraction spots with x-rays, if you do an x-ray diffraction rather than electron diffraction, you discover those peaks aren't really brag, whereas in the ideal pattern, they should be. 
For, furthermore, if you look at the alignment of the peaks, they form a pattern which is nearly like the one on the left, but there are systematic differences if you study it closely. And that left room for alternative ideas, alternative explanations for, for uh, what had been discovered. But these questions were resolved with, a few years later with the discovery of, of, a, of a new classes of quasi-crystals, beginning with this one, uh, by a group in Japan led by Anpang Sai, which you can see now, instead of getting a kind of feathery, disordered looking grain, we're now getting a beautifully faceted grain. This particular quasi-crystal gave diffraction peaks which were bragged to within the X-ray uh, diffraction resolution and were perfectly aligned. So this showed that quasi-crystals are indeed possible. They do exist, you can make them in the laboratory. In this particular example made by slowly quenching a, com a particular combination of metals. And in the years since, the subject has grown over a hundred, maybe it's now by now close to 150 different combinations of elements have been found which form quasi-crystals, many of them as perfect or nearly as perfect as the example shown here. Well, it was all well and fine and very exciting to discover that quasi-crystals can be synthesized in the laboratory. And what, some of the work that I did over the coming years involved trying to understand the physical properties that distinguish quasi-crystals from crystals. But another issue that came up almost immediately in my mind was this question. Is it possible that nature beat us to the punch? Is it possible that we've missed the fact that nature already made quasi-crystals long before they were synthesized in the laboratory? Of course, we know crystals that were found in nature before they were synthesized in a laboratory, but maybe quasi-crystals, the story is the reverse. Um, uh, so uh, is, that, is it possible? And um, it's a subject which I was pursuing on and off over the next decades without much success. I could talk for a long time about all the interesting failures along the way, but I will skip that in order to keep this talk within the allotted time and, and skip to a point uh, 23 years later when I received an email from this fellow, Luca Bindi, who was at the time head of the Division of Mineralogy at the Museo di Storia Naturale at, in the at, the, at the University of Florence. I had never met him, he had never met me, but he had read about a paper in which I, in which I and my colleagues had discussed searching for natural quasi-crystals in a systematic way uh, we might do it, and he wanted to join the search. Now, what I didn't know when I first got this email was that uh, Luca had two remarkable properties. Uh, or I'd say more than two remarkable properties. Uh, first was that he immediately became as fanatical about this subject as I was. So even though we faced a lot of challenges over the next few years, it was he who was a lot, you know, always you know, at the side, you know, brainstorming and how to get around one impossible barrier or another. Secondly, he's a remarkably talented mineralogist not only with good eyes, but also with good hands. He's able to do things on micro scale, which I guess with his, hand, his hands and uh, needles that most people can't accomplish. And then the third thing is it turned out that so happened that in his museum, he had a material which I didn't have recorded in any of the catalogs of minerals that I, that I had at hand, but he had a sample of, which he pointed out might be of particular interest. I should say it took a year of interaction before this occurred because there were a lot of failures over that next year. But finally, he pointed out this particular material that was in the basement of his museum in a set of drawers, uh, part of a collection of thousands of other uh, micro mounted simples, samples. Um, this one was labeled Katirkite and described itself as uh, having come from Katirka in the Koryak mount mountains of Russia. Uh, the sample is here in this box compared to a 50 cent piece, and you can see it's rather small. Actually, uh, it's not most of the stuff in the box. Most of the stuff in the box is uh, essentially a putty holding the sample in place. The sample is the thing at the very tip. If we focus in on that, 
well, now it looks like a giant rock. Well, it's not a, it's not a giant, but it is a rock. It's composed, you can see, not of a pure, it's not a pure mineral, but it contains a complex combination of minerals. Some of them very familiar, like olivines and pyroxenes, but also the darkish material, which turns out to be metallic, a mixture of aluminum, copper, and iron. And then, thinking that there was nothing particularly uh, special about this sample, um, Luca did what he had been doing for all the studies that we, we had been done, doing up to that point. He basically removed, destroyed most of the material, forming from it just a few slices thin enough in which to uh, do some electro, electron probe studies. And when he did those electron probe studies, and you can see an example of the studies on one of these surfaces here, he found that the metallic material that inside the sample was a complex combination of at least four different combinations of elements. Um, all the yellow points the probe showed have co had compositions corresponding to CuAl2. And that is the chemical formula for katirkite, which the box claimed this was a sample of. So in fact, the sample labeled katirkite really had katirkite in it among the many minerals in there. Let me, as a slight digression, point out that was actually a piece of luck. Uh, nowadays, when you go to mineral shows, there's a good chance, because of the famous fame of this story has achieved in the interim, that you will find samples of katirkite being sold. But I should warn you, at least all the ones I've gathered or Lucas gathered and tested, we've never found one which actually had katirka in it. They were all fakes of one sort or another. But this one was not a fake. This one really had katirkite in it. And not only that, it had those red points, which are copper aluminum, which is another mineral in the Inter International Mineralogical Association catalog, along with katirkite. Um, so those are two already known minerals. And then it contained two other combinations, the green spots and the blue spots, which didn't correspond to anything in any mineralogical catalog that we knew. So what Luca did was carefully, using his handcraft and needlecraft, picked out those particular tiny grains, and you get in a sense uh, what scale he was dealing on, and sent the grains to me at Princeton, where we could isolate them, isolate into individual grains, find one that was thin enough that one could do transmission electron microscopy on it. And uh, it was on New Year's 2009, about five in the morning, that, uh, that uh, Nan Yao, our director of imaging at Princeton and I met to check out whether or not uh, there was anything interesting about this sample. And the very first place we looked at was this thin region in the upper red circle. And the very first thing that popped out within a matter of minutes was this pattern. Now, this is highly overexposed. When you actually look at the pattern in an electron microscope, all those big, broad spots are actually point-like. This is as perfect a pattern as ever seen for any material uh, synthesized in the laboratory, much more perfect than, for example, uh, Schechmann's original sample. Furthermore, when we rotated along different directions, we found it not only had this five-fold symmetry, but it had the appropriate uh, three and two-fold symmetries at the appropriate angles that you, one could reconstruct a full three-dimensional icosahedral symmetry. Then, when we measured its composition, we found it was 63% aluminum, 24% copper, and 13% iron. An amazing, an amazing result, striking result, uh, because, well, it may not be obvious to you, or you may not have noticed, but that's essentially the same composition as the first true quasi-crystal that was found by Anpang Tsai and his colleagues back in 1987. Except when Anpang Tsai made his material, he did it by carefully isolating the aluminum, copper, and iron, putting it in a closed container, letting it cool over a sequence of days until it made these beautiful uh, quasi-crystallites, faceted quasi-crystallites. Whereas material we were looking at, it was in these blue dotted grains over here, 
which are mishmash with a bunch of other materials, which uh, under conditions that you'd never think to ever make something as complex as a quasi crystal. But there it is, there's the data. How, what did nature know that we didn't? Or what could this tell us about nature? These were the two questions that came to mind. So it could have been the end of the story. We could have simply ce celebrated and published the fact that natural quasi-crystals existed. But instead, I found myself a few days later going up the street to meet uh, Lincoln Hollister, who I imagine many of you know, a famous petrologist at Princeton University, who's you know had many been involved in many projects, included among them is um, studying the first some of the first uh, moon rocks to come back from. Apollo from the Apollo mission. And I explained to Lincoln the story that I've explained to you up to this point and asked him the question that I just phrased, which is just posed, which is what is this telling us about nature or nature telling us about quasi crystals? And uh, after thinking a moment quietly, he said, well, I have to tell you that what you have there is and impossible was his word. And that stunned me. And I, what do you mean impossible? Uh, impossible is a word which uh, I had encountered before in other uh, uh, studies in physics. And um, it was always a word that attracted me because I always felt there were two versions of impossible. And in fact, I uh, began to say to him, but hold it, it can't be impossible because in fact, this has been made in the laboratory. And I can even show you examples of a sample of it. And he said, no, no, no. I'm not questioning whether there's a quasi-crystal or whether or not quasi-crystals exist at all, because I actually know nothing about quasi-crystals. However, what you told me is that you have an alloy, which is a mixture of aluminum, iron, and copper, metallic aluminum, iron, and copper. And metallic aluminum does not occur in nature because aluminum has a such a huge um, um, propensity to bound to bond with um, oxygen. In fact, that's why we have aluminum foundries and the like. And so uh, he, he gave me a little lecture on why metallic aluminum was impossible. Uh, I then asked him the question, which I always ask when the word impossible comes up, which is, uh, well, when you say impossible, which kind of impossible do you mean? Do you mean impossible like is one plus one equal to three? Or do you mean impossible, like we've never seen it before and we have various assumptions as to why we haven't seen it before, but maybe one of those assumptions is wrong. And I thought at this point, well, if I had known him better and known his reputation, I might've thought at this point he was gonna kick me out of his office or throw me out of his window. After all, I was just being some impertinent theoretical physicist asking ridiculous questions. But um, fortunately he did not. Fortunately, he gave my question a serious attention. He said, well, if I were forced to come up with a theory to explain this as a natural mineral, it would have to be that it was formed under some enormous pressure, which would allow the, uh, the uh, would, would produce the conditions needed to reduce the aluminum. And the conditions we, where those would occur would be deep under the earth, maybe near the core mantle boundary. Of course, then you'd have to find some mechanism to take that material up from near that boundary up to the surface. And that's not as crazy as, or impossible uh, as one might think because people in my own department, he explained, have talked about the possibility of there existing ancient super plumes. And then he began to explain to me about super plumes and I probably wasn't listening that closely because what came to my mind was, oh, it's impossible of the second kind impossible, unlikely to be true, but if true, very, very interesting. Well, after he explained, finished explaining about super plumes, I asked another important and really stupid question, which was, is it possible that these formed uh, from meteors that, you know, in space? After all, I said, there's no oxygen in space, which was a really stupid statement because there's plenty of oxygen in space. I was just too stupid not to know that. What? Well, um, fortunately, he didn't again call me out for that. He said, well, actually, I don't know that much about meteors, but I know someone who does. And a week later, we went to visit Glenn McPherson, who's the head of the Division of Meteorites at the Smithsonian Institution to 
discuss uh, media rights. He was already waiting for us at the door uh, of the museum when we arrived. And even before we could check in, he began telling us about uh, his conclusions about the material that Lincoln had sent him about our discovery. And he wanted to tell us right off the bat that we had there was definitely impossible. Couldn't be meteoritic. He knew about meteorites of all kinds. There was no meteor which would have this material in it, nor there are many other properties in the meteor which would be about the meteor that seemed to be inconsistent uh, with it being natural. And he lectured us or me uh, uh, with Lincoln listening for about the next three hours about all the various reasons. At the end, he said, I'm sorry to tell you that what you have there is simply a piece of a, either a four letter word, slag, um, material, which is some kind of you know, leftover from some foundry or experiment or something like that. And I'm sure that at the end of that visit, he and Lincoln were pretty confident they would never hear from us again. What they didn't appreciate was that uh, Luca and I, to individually and collectively working together, uh, were pretty stubborn and weren't going to simply give up that easily without first finding out where this sample really did come from. If it really came from, did it really come from the Koryak Mountains in the middle of nowhere, far Eastern Russia, in which case it's hard to see how it'd be accidentally synthesized. Uh, and secondly, from the few grains we had left, to study the material, could we prove that the rock alone, just from the rock alone, from the material we had left of it, that it wasn't slag? And so, such so began a year and a half investigation of these two questions, going back and forth and back and forth, each making progress and retrogress uh, at different times. In terms of the first question, does the sample in there's a sample that was originally at, uh, found in Flor in the Florence Museum basement. Um, storehouse, storeroom, does that really come from the Koryak Mountains? Well, that was turned out to be a detective story, a novel length detective story, literally novel length detective story. Uh, in fact, I've written a book about it, if you, any of you are interested in it, it's called The Second Kind of Impossible. And it tells the story of all the ins and outs of this detective story over the next year and a half. But again, I don't want to take the time to give that novel length story here. I'll just mention that it included, as its first step, finding a missing Dutchman, a Dutchman who had given the sample or actually uh, sold the sample to the Florence Museum about 20 years earlier. Uh, we didn't exactly find him, but we find di found diaries left from him that pointed us to where he had gotten the material from, which was on a trip to Romania to visit Tim. Tim the Romanian, Tim the Romanian, who was one of a group of smugglers who were smuggling minerals out of Russia. And where were they smuggling this particular material from? Well, it was from a, a laboratory in St. Petersburg, which was, um, had get, had, was obtaining material from uh, a fellow who was at the time, in Soviet times, the head of the Institute of Platinum, and who had obtained it, obtained samples as part of a search for platinum. He himself, as you might imagine, it's Soviet times and it's Institute for Platinum, a very valuable defense material. He himself was heavily connected to the Soviet, uh, to the Communist Party, and was in fact in close cahoots with the KGB. In fact, he was known, I learned later, to use his KGB connections often against his enemies, that is to say, to get them sent, sent away if they were uh, getting in his way of his searching for platinum in one location or another. Well, all this and other twists and turns took place over the next year until we finally, about a year after the first discovery, found, uh, found our way to this fellow, Valerie Kriachko, who was actually the fellow who really did find the original material back in 1979, sent by this head of the Institute of Platinum to an obscure region in far Eastern Russia to look for platinum. Uh, he had been sent there, and it was a scene very much like this. This is actually a few years later on a different expedition, but it would have been a scene very much like this. Um, and he was sent there to look for platinum, but failed to find it. Instead, he found some shiny minerals, which he knew weren't platinum, 
but he wanted to prove that he had actually been working and hadn't just been loafing. So he brought them back with him, gave them to the head of the Institute of Platinum. And that was the last he had heard about them. He didn't know the fellow had studied them at the St. Petersburg, at a, at a laboratory in St. Petersburg, had discovered new minerals, had published the new minerals and smuggled some of it out. The only thing he knew was, well, at the, by the time we had published our results, that he was now connected to this bigger story. And he was very eager to tell us all about what his role had been, where he had found them, and even to point out on a map exactly where they had been discovered, namely in the northern half, uh, I'm sorry, in the um, province just north of the um, Kamchatka Peninsula, in the province of Chukotka, or the Okug of uh, Chukotka, across the Bering Straits from Alaska, in a very, in the Koryak Mountains, in a place that's very desolate, had no foundries in it. Uh, and um, so that was very good news for us that we now knew where to, the material had come from and that it was not coming from some foundry someplace or some laboratory someplace, but literally the middle of nowhere. In the meantime, we were trying to work on this rock, or I should say these grains left from the rock to see what we could learn from them. And in the process, we discovered um, a number of interest that, that these few grains contain complex combinations of, and heterogeneous combinations of all kinds of interesting minerals aside from our quasi crystal. They included, for example, arancite, which is an iron, rare iron rich form of ringwoodite, which only forms under high pressure. Those little ladders you see on the left, these rivulets or ladders, are. Uh, regions in which uh, mineral melted for some reason, uh, and um, it when it and after remelting, it formed those ladders which are alternating runs of arancite and amorphous silica. In order to form those, you had to reach high temperatures and high pressures, pressures which were you know on the order of gigapascals or higher. Similarly, we found another interesting grain, the grain on the right which turns out to be a grain of stichovite, a grain that under forms, for, only forms under ultra high pressures and which um, again, similar at uh, on the order of uh, five to 10 gigapascals. So it's only a, a high pressure material. And within that material, it was included, it was, that's what you're seeing at the bottom, uh, totally included a grain of quasi crystal, of the same quasi crystal. So now we knew that uh, our quasi crystal had to form under a condition which involved ultra high pressures, not the kind of thing you're gonna find in a foundry or in a typical laboratory. So that what, the, what we were seeing over and over again was signs that uh, this material that under experienced pressures, you know, 100,000, 50 or 100,000 times atmospheric pressure, high temperatures, highish temperatures, at least greater than 1400 degrees and the distribution of material and temperatures and pressures was highly heterogeneous. This was enough to convince, to, to re, I should say, to reduce the possibility, the possible theories for this material, to eliminate the ideas that it was from a foundry and, and from a laboratory, but also many I, other ideas, and take us back to the original two ideas we had, that either this material was formed deep under the earth under high pressure or in outer space under high pressure. And to resolve that, we joined with John Eiler and Yun Bing Guan at Caltech, uh, who used their ion microprobe to measure the oxygen isotopes in our sample of the different minerals in our sample to see if they would instruct us where our sample had come from. And it took a summer of measurements to come up with results, but when they came out, they were outstanding. Every mineral gave exactly the same conclusion which is our material was definitely extraterrestrial, corresponding to a meteoritic isotopic, rare isotope combinations. In fact, not only was it an extraterrestrial, not only was it an asteroid or meteoroid, but it was an asteroid of a particular type, a CB3 carbonaceous chondrite, the kind of asteroid that was formed, or at least parts of it were formed, at the beginning of the solar system around four and a half billion years ago. Our goal had been to find something that was older than 1982, 
the time when Schekman first saw his quasi crest in the laboratory, at four and a half billion years, we more than exceeded our goal. Uh, now, when the data was shown to Glenn McPherson, our meteorite expert, we were keeping on board. We kept Lincoln and Glenn on board because we, you know, the goal was to see if they could convince us or we could convince them. The moment he saw the data, his view turned 180 degrees. There was no doubt in his mind that what we had here was meteoritic and no doubt in his mind that he wanted to study more of this material. Unfortunately, as I had to inform him, uh, that was impossible because every bit of material had been used up to this point to get to the information we already had. The only place you could possibly imagine looking for it, more material would be where the original material was found, which Valeria Kriachko had told us was in Chukotka. But just because he had found a few grains in 1979, doesn't mean you're gonna find one in 2011 or 2010. Uh, that would be a kind of crazy thing to even try. And anyway, it's impossible because you'd have to get permission from the government. You'd have to get permission from the mili Russian military. You'd have to get permission from the Russian FSB, the modern equivalent of the KGB. Chukotka is a forbidden region even for Russians. They need special permits to go there. So you're also going to need permissions from the local government and the local military, the local police, and on and on and on. And by the way, you also might need some money in order to accomplish the task. So you, know, you pile up those list of things and it's obviously an impossible and even crazy thing to attempt to do. Yet, here are the crazy people attempting to do it. Here's July 22nd, 2011, uh, us gathered. It's five Americans, seven Russians, an Italian, Luca in the middle. And in the very middle at the bottom there, even a cat, we're not even a single species going. Uh, and preparing to go on, a, on our trip across the tundra to the site where the original quasi crystal that was, that was found in Russia, that was found in Florence, was, had been found, uh, had originally been discovered by Valeri, who is the third from the right in the picture that you're seeing there. I should say as a personal note, all these people had a lot of outdoor experience, most of them geological experience, most of them expeditional experience, except for the leader of the expedition, the one fellow who really didn't belong here, the theoretical physicist who works with chalk and pencil and paper for most of the time, and maybe a computer, but doesn't go out on expeditions like that. In fact, this particular guy had no outdoor experience. He hadn't even camped in his backyard before. Fortunately, he had lots of people to provide support, especially his tent mate, and his tent mate is this fellow, and his name, he actually shares the last name of the guy in the first oval. Uh, that's my son, Will, who at that time was a geo geoscience major at Caltech, just graduated. He's nowadays a postdoc in geoscience at UC Santa Cruz. And fortunately, he got to lead me and show me the ropes, which led to, as you can imagine, any of you that have children, lots and lots of fun for him and lots of good jokes for him. The expedition was quite an adventure. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in it, but just to give you some impression, this is what it was like to cross the tundra. Stream after stream after stream going up and down in this way. These vehicles seemed invulnerable at first. Here's an example, we're following a trail and all of a sudden the trail has come to an end and the driver, Victor, is driving right towards this forest. I'm looking at him say, where's the trail, Victor? Where's the trail? And he gives me a wry look as if to ask, what trail? What, who needs a trail? And this might lead you to think that these trucks were invulnerable, invulnerable but they were not. There were various points of danger, various points where we got stuck, where we almost had a fire, and then there was this scary crossing of the Khatirka River, the widest river that we had to cross, because we had been told, or they were telling us, that these vehicles were supposed to be able to float, but no one had tested them before. And no one had tested them laden down the way we were tested. So fortunately, there wasn't a problem. And we did make it across. We did get to the site. There were, as you might imagine, billions and 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 billions of mosquitoes. There were bears, I promised bears. 
These are Kanchaka brown bears. These are not pleasant creatures. These are among the most vicious bears. And we were told we might see two or three because they tend to be shy. We saw over 20, which meant it was high season for bears. There were bear tracks around our, our camp at various times. But fortunately, there was also lots of salmon in the stream and that seemed to keep them occupied while we were there. We found the site where Valeri in the middle there had first found, found the very first sample that made its way to Florence. Uh, there's uh, Luca on the left and me on the right. And then we started days of expedition, gathering material, digging, um, panning, uh, structural man mapping, uh, doing a little bit of separation in the laboratory of uh, first candidates we wanted to study. Uh, although the, you really can't tell when you're out in the field a quasi-crystal from any other mineral. You don't have the right equipment. We stayed there for a period working daily. Uh, by the time we left, August 3rd, fall, you can see how we're more warmly dressed now. Fall had come to uh, Chukotka. Um, we left the next day. Uh, a, a day out, we turned around the next morning and we discovered that winter had come to uh, Chukotka. Uh, where we were is where those snow covered mountains are in the back. If we hadn't left when we did, we would have been stuck there and had to have been rescued. And that easily could have been the end of the story. Because as I said, the chances of finding even one grain of material that was meteoritic out of the entire stream of materials that we were collecting, the millions and millions of grains we were collecting was you know, uh, a shot in the dark. We had very little chance of success. Yet, six weeks later, Luca, who was looking grain by grain at the individual uh, grains that we had uh, collected, now these material had been moved back to uh, Italy and the US, and Luca was looking at his share of samples, came up with this sample, beautiful meteoritic material in the dark, and a lighter material, a silvery material shown there. And when he performed an X-ray diffraction pattern and, uh, of, the, of the, uh, that material, he found a beautiful tenfold pattern. And when he used micro electron microprobe to measure its composition, he found a composition which was just like that, which um, we had been observing in the sample in Florence. This was an incredible moment because the story I've told you about the Florence sample and how we traced it back to this uh, Valerian the stream had lots of iffy moments in the story. But in this case, we knew exactly where this particular grain had been found. It had been found at the stream. We, several, of us, several of us were there to witness it. It was found in clay material, which we dated later using carbon dating to back to 10,000 years. So it had been in the ground for at least 10,000 years. And, um, and sure enough, it was the same as the material that we had found that had been found in the fluoride sample. Now we really knew our material was what we thought it was, natural material that had formed in likely in a meteorite. And it led to the official acceptance of this material, which is now called icosahedrite by the International Mineralogical Association, the first example of a quasi-crystal accepted by the IMA as a natural mineral. And over the next year or so, as we kept going through the millions of grains, we found more samples. We found so far a total of nine of them. And each one of them is chock full of information, complex information about the composition of this meteorite, which was highly heterogeneous. Uh, no better one than this particular example, a beautiful example which shows a collision, uh, complex collision of materials. The lighter material, the whitish stuff is mostly the metal, uh, aluminum, copper, iron in various combinations, the darker material, silicates of various kind, some of it high pressure materials, some of it not high pressure materials, some of it materials had obviously melted in some kind of high pressure collision, some of it which had not melted. It included, in fact, grains like this one, which had katirkite, cupolite, and icosahedrite all next door to one another, just like we had found in the Florence sample. This particular region, it looked to be in a region which had not melted in whatever collision had taken place. So this seemed to pre-exist whatever had been the most recent collision. At the same time, we found a different quasi-crystal, a different icosahedral phase, again, aluminum, iron, copper, but in a composition that is outside the usual domain of compositions associated with quasi-icosahedral aluminum, iron, copper, far from the initial domain. We don't even know yet if it's a separated domain or under high pressures or high pressure, uh, high pressures, it might somehow be connected. 
that's, that's not clear yet. And we find many other co complexities. The bottom line is what we think, what we learned about from our study of the quasi crystals from space is that a key element in their formation, it's not enough to explain everything, but a key element in their formation is that the sample underwent ultra high velocity, high pressure shocks. And those shocks produced a heterogeneous and rapidly time vary, vary, varying pressure and temperature fields. And they produced adiabatic compression conditions and hypersonic tubular, uh, turbulent shear flows. You can see evidence of all that in the sample samples and all that seems to play a, seem to play a role in the formation of the complex materials we saw in the rocks. Seeing that we decided to check in the laboratory, if in the laboratory we could reproduce those conditions with a control shock experiment using essentially the equivalent of a cannon. So this is a, this, these pictures are from Tom Aaron's laboratory at Caltech and working with Paul Asimo in that lab. Uh, and well, he calls it a gas gun, but I like to be more dramatic and call it a cannon. Uh, we fired uh, supersonic, at supersonic speeds, a tantalum, tantalum plate at a stack of materials, which were be materials, raw materials, which might be compositional materials of the meteorite. And uh, what, uh, here's an example of what the stack of materials was. Um, olivine, copper, aluminum five, canyon Diablo, iron, nickel, and aluminum bronze, all in a steel casing. And this is after the shock. You can see on the right-hand side, especially, there's of the stack, there were a number of interactions taking place. Here, this is around 500 micron scale. If we focus in at around the 200 micron scale and we look inside that little box, inside that little box turns out to be a costahedral phase. An aluminum iron copper composition, pretty close to what was found in the Katirka meteorite. In this case though, actually it's a new quasi crystal because it also contains uh, uh, composition which includes chromium and nickel. In fact, we found in subsequent shock experiments like this, we would commonly make quasi-crystals e which were even more complex and hitherto unknown quasi-crystals. What they all had in common was that in this experiment, the pressures were at around 14 to 21 gigapascals. And again, you can see the materials we make are highly heterogeneous. And um, by pressures, I mean, these are pressures which are the shock maximum pressures. So here, for example, for that acosahedral phase is the, project, the X -ray, projection of the X-ray diffraction pattern down a five-fold axis. You can see it's quite beautiful. And this is the first quasi-crystal in the aluminum, at least in the, that I know of, but at least for sure in the aluminum copper iron system that was synthesized in a shock experiment at these high pressures. And not only that, but it repro it's reproduces the phenomenon and even some of the morphology that we saw in the Katirka meteorite. Now, if quasi-crystals are made by shocks in outer space, and then you could make them again in laboratory shock experiments, why not other shock experiments? In fact, why not here? Well, this may not seem like an obvious place to look for a shock experiment unless I tell you that uh, the year is uh, 1945, this is July 16th. The location is the desert in New Mexico, the Alamogordo Desert. And inside that cabin at the top is a gadget, what well, was known as the gadget, a plutonium gadget, an implosion, uh, an implosion device, implosion nuclear device. In fact, it, a test, part of the Trinity test designed to test for uh, whether the implosion idea worked. So I might remind you that in the Manhattan Project, both the uranium atomic bomb and a plutonium atomic bomb were designed, were designed. The uranium bomb required ordinary, an ordinary method to put together the critical mass, which didn't have to be tested. The plutonium bomb, in order to create the critical mass, required an implosion. And implosions had never been tested. So that was the reason for the Alamogordo test. So at 529.45, mountain war time, we can find the time very precisely in Alamogordo, New Mexico, the device was set off. 1.5 seconds later, it looked like this. 14.8 seconds later, 
18.1 seconds later, and of course, ultimately like this. And this was the, this was the uh, Alamogordo Trinity test. In that test, the Arcosic sands that's made that made up the desert were um, fused in, in numerous uh, fused in this region in many places to form a um, well to form a, a a fused glass which came to be known as trinitite. Here's an example seven days after the uh, explosion of what the site looked like, and you can see in the distance a kind of um, um, kind of rim. Of, uh, uh, that was created by the uh, created by the explosion, um, and um, most of this trinitite, and you can find trinitite. Many of you probably have it or have seen it. Uh, is greenish, um, and that's sort of the typical example of trinitite. But there's a special subclass of trinitite which is known as red trinitite, and this red trinitite formed along the regions in which along the copper in which the copper cabling from the um, uh, from the building which I showed you in which the device was set off, the copper cabling uh, was uh, connected and the red the red material in there is uh, uh, due to the fact that some of the copper from that cabling got mixed in with the glass to form a reddish trinitite which looks like this. So these are various samples of red trinitite. We were became when uh, we came across a paper which was describing all these trinitites. When we saw this exa these examples of red trinitite, we immediately wanted to test them because, well, there you had metal, which is common, copper is common to many of the known quasi-crystals, mixing with some other com odd combinations of materials. That would be a place to look for quasi-crystals. Of course, saying that and doing that are two different things. Uh, you know, how are you gonna, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. In this case, the haystack consisted of, we had 12 samples of this red trinitite that had been passed on uh, from um, uh, a geologist who had been to the site back in 1945 and collected samples and, and had passed them on uh, to someone who then passed them on to us. Uh, and we looked through 12 of these samples, slicing and dicing and testing them. And I should say we, once again, this is our miracle man, Luca, who's doing most of his testing and gathering in, this, uh, uh, in these experiments. Uh, and we found one a particularly interesting sample, which is the example which is shown on the right. Um, this is what it, on the right is shown what it looked like before it was sliced and diced. Uh, when a thin enough sample was made, uh, we could, do, um, could be studied with transmitted light. You see in the example there, there's a piece of uh, what looks like a metallic droplet. So the usual green size, uh, the usual green trinitite typically is really just fused uh, silicon dioxide, but here uh, in the red trinitite, and that's what it attracted our attention, there are these metal droplets that also form. And here is a blow up of the material of that sample. Um, uh, most of the sample that you're looking at there, you see, uh, on, most of the sample you're seeing there in the upper left is shown on the right to contain silicon. So most of it is silicon dioxide. That little white thing, a uh, little white speck, which is in the circle on the left, is a metal droplet, which is shown in blow up below uh, on the lower left. And you see it is mostly copper. It's copper and copper two sulfate, uh, copper sulfide. And then there's a little speck of yet something else again, which is this mixture of silicon, copper, calcium, and iron. And on the right, you see the X-ray maps. And you see, and from that and, uh, and, and probe, we were able to put together, an electron probe, we were able to put together the um, composition of, the, of this sample. And when we isolated this grain and uh, performed X ray uh, diffraction experiment on it, it produced a series of diffraction patterns along the different axes. This is a reconstructed procession um, uh, patterns. It, it showed patterns along the tenfold direction, which are the one that's in the big box on the left, along the twofold direction, which are like the one on the upper right, and along the threefold direction on the ones which are in the lower right. And the angles between these various directions were precisely the angles that one would expect for an icosahedron. So what we were looking at was indeed an icosahedral quasi-crystal once again.
but one which had formed under unusual conditions, to say the least, and which had a number of distinctions. Uh, the pressures under which it formed are believed to be as high as eight gigapascals or higher with temperatures of around 2000 K. This is based on mineralogical and chemical analysis of trinitite samples, including red trinitites. Um, uh, uh, curiously, these are values which are not so different from what we were doing, at least in terms of pressure, I should say, from what we were studying in terms of pressure in the laboratory at Caltech with our cannon, or that we had inferred from our mineralogical studies at the Katirka meteorite. So we're playing in the same sort of the same ball game, oddly enough, although under very different circumstances. This is, turns out to now be the oldest extant anthropogenic quasi-crystal. Of course, the natural quasi-crystals far outdate or far older than anthropogenic ones. But up to this point, we thought the oldest anthropogenic ones were the ones that Schechtman and his colleagues had synthesized in, in the 1980s. This is about, uh, what, 25, more than 25 years earlier. Um, so this is now the world record holder for anthropogenic quasi-crystal. It's the first report of a quasi-crystal with this com chemical composition. Nothing close to this chemical com composition has been seen before. In fact, it's the first report of a quasi-crystal which is dominantly silicon. So that's pretty, uh, there's a number of firsts. And through that, it suggests a number of, th through this and the other studies we've done, it suggests uh, a number of new directions of study in terms of quasi-crystals. We might wonder why we haven't seen more quasi-crystals already scientifically in nature or in the laboratory. And it may be that a route to making quasi-crystals involves shocking. There's shocking, among other things, seems to allow us to strip materials or elements which normally bind to oxygen like silicon and aluminum and unbind them so that they form essentially metallic bonds with other materials. This allows various new combinations of minerals you wouldn't normally see at room temperature and room pressures or even in high pressure anvil experiments. So these shock environments seem to be advantageous for forming quasi-crystals. We have various ideas very, uh, I'll say, uh, fuzzy ideas why this may be so, but this is enough to suggest a whole series of new experiments that we are pursuing. Also, our experts in nuclear forensics tell us that the fact that you find this quasi-crystal here in this test suggests that looking for them and minerals, other quasi-crystals and other minerals may be a new approach to uh, add to our uh, the tools of nuclear forensics. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that have been learned from this from this adventure so far. Um, this, you might ask, is this the end? Uh, probably not, but it is the end of the talk. I think I will stop here and ask for questions. Thank you, Paul, for a wonderful talk. Wonderful story. Thank you. We still have uh, some 70 people online. Feel free to ask questions. You can use the chat box or raise your hand. And you're going to run this, uh, Russ? Uh, Bob Hazen. Okay. Go ahead. Yes, Paul, thank you. You know, I've been following your work for years now, and it's just absolutely fascinating. Um, I do still have a question. I'm moving to a place where I can turn on my uh, visuals here. Yeah, I'm. Is there been any further sort of understanding of the chemistry of these weird alloys i mean it's it's not just that you have copper and aluminum and and other elements it's that it, and that they're very reduced but those are elements that don't typically uh, occur together in geological environments so um has, has, has there been further understanding from a, a nebular condensation point of view or, or some other aspect about that thanks for the question bob yeah it's always uh uh it's always good to talk to you. Uh, I would love to say the answer is yes, <laughs> but I'm, I'm sorry to say that that remains a mystery to us. <clears throat> We've eliminated some possibilities along the way. Uh, the idea of it forming straight from the nebular gas is the best idea we have at the moment, but we haven't been, been able to reproduce those conditions or haven't tried and haven't been able to reproduce those conditions to see if that idea would work. So that's definitely, that's definitely an, a mystery. Uh, how do you get that combination of materials together in the first place? 
those combinations of metallic materials, those combinations of elements together in the first place. I think what we are learning is that um, these shocks, whether we find them uh, in the meteors or in the uh, cannon experiments or in the atomic tests, they, they do help in reducing, um, mineral, producing re highly reducing conditions uh, of one, uh, by one means or another. I, not that we understand that, but we observe that to be the case. And, uh, and, and then it may turn out that once you've unleashed such materials and elements that way, um, that it's favorable for them to arrange themselves, to pack themselves in, in new combinations we don't normally observe in the laboratory, which would be quasi-crystalline ones. So in other words, as you, um, you might imagine if you try to form allies with more and more elements, it might be harder and harder to form a uh, crystal and easier and easier to form a quasi-crystal. We have a set of sort of heuristic arguments along that line. And so maybe that's a connected part of the story, but honestly, that's part of the open mystery. Yeah, thanks very much. I think you're absolutely right. I think as you get these chemical complexity, then the quasi-crystal gives you a lot more packing options, but it's getting to a point where you have copper and aluminum sufficient concentrations in a, right. a, you know, they're rare elements relative to some of the things like iron and nickel. And so, you know, it's a surprise. Thanks very much. I know you're going yeah. to be working on it. Absolutely. Thanks, Bob. Good to hear from you. I think Roald Hoffman was next. Yeah, that's a great story. And I can appreciate the bears having spent a couple of weeks in Kamchatka dealing with bears and uh, using, <laughs> using, using the salmon to distract the bears is exactly what we did. Um, the, what was a little unclear to me is, first of all, how metallic are these quasi-crystals? Um, uh, I mean, you said there, you called them metallic without saying much about it. And the other thing is, you really didn't give us a structure in the sense of atomic uh, of the atomic connections of these. So what is the structure? Okay, so um, so in terms of the metallicity, what I mean by metal is simply that they are metallic. I mean, they, they're, they're not forming, uh, forming covalent bonds. They're forming metallic, uh, metallic bonds uh, is what I meant uh, by that. Um, in terms of their electrical conductivity, uh, well, the, these natural materials are going to be highly defected. So you're gonna be dominated by defects. Uh, in terms of the ideal materials and what we know theoretically, they have unusual conductivity properties owing to the fact that uh, they, um, uh, that they're, they're not periodic and they're not disordered. So uh, if you were going to compare it to ordinary crystals, uh, you would say instead of having uh, a single single large, a single band gap, where you might have a single band gap, you would have now uh, many band gaps of ever finer size in the perfect state. Uh, one of the properties that this leads to is that the electrical conductivity of the ordered sample uh, becomes small as you cool it and make it more perfect. And if you actually bombard it and make it disordered, the conductivity actually increases, opposite of what you'd expect for a crystal. So these are some of the things we know, mm -hmm. but a lot of the properties of quasi-crystals are not yet worked out <clears throat> and theoretically the way we understand them for crystals. And that's because almost all of the theory of crystals relies on periodicity. And here they're explicitly not periodic and simply taking a limit of periodic structures, which goes to periodic isn't necessarily a reliable way of mathematically of solving the problem. So kind of a famous, it's a famous theoretical problem, even in one dimensional quasi periodic systems. As for the atomic structure, that's also been you know, a longstanding issue in this study of quasi crystals. Some like the aluminum, iron, copper are pretty well worked out. I didn't show an image of it and I can't call up one quickly, <clears throat> but <clears throat> at sort of the 90% level, the structure is um, 
pretty much solved um, by looking at analog crystals and then imagining how those elements could recombine to form quasi-crystals. Um, they would form units, they would tend to form units um, which overlap with, with which their icosahedral structures with icosahedral order would tend to be embedded as part of the structure, but then you have to have material that connects them in, uh, well, let's see, if you want to get some idea of that, let me go back to an early um, slide I had. Are you still able to see the slides? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going back to my, I was trying to go back to my, back to my model here, yeah. So if you think about this model here, uh, let, me go, let me go back to one layer of it. Uh, so those red, those red blocks in there are actually fully three-dimensional icosahedral sphere, like spheres. They're rhombic, they're rhombic triacontahedron, but they have a full icosahedral symmetry to them. The other units do not. You know, so it's not made entirely of things with icosahedral blocks. It's made of things with icosahedral blocks, but also pieces of, the, of icosahedral blocks. So, um, so that you could build up the structure from units which have local symmetry, but things which must break the symmetry so that you can complete the structure without having gaps. So it's much more complex than anything we know for crystals. And we can't use all the tools uh, that we normally use for crystals to determine the atomic structure. That's what makes it hard. So for crystals, it's kind of a simple business. If I see a diffraction pattern that I'm looking at a cubic crystal, I know I can reduce it to a single unit cell, a cube, and I only have to figure out what only uncertainty left is what atoms are left in that, how the atoms decorate that cube. For a quasi-crystal, if I tell you the symmetry, let's say is an icosahedral symmetry, I can make an infinite number of different configurations of these building blocks, each of which has that symmetry. And I don't know which one corresponds, is the best fit to my material that I'm looking at. And then I have, in addition, the freedom of decorating the units in different ways. So the problem does not separate out mathematically um, um, uh, the way it does for a crystal in that you can deconvolve the diffraction pattern into its structure factor and form factor. It doesn't work for a quasi-crystal. And that's one of the things that's made determining all the positions of all atoms in quasi-crystals very, very difficult. So we have examples, as I said, which are at the 90% level, but not examples that you know, we could say are 100% sure. Thanks. Okay, thanks. We still have at least five more questions, um, starting with Jack Schlichter, and then move to Dave Walker. Jack is asking, are larger quasi-crystals impossible is that a type one or type two impossibility? Uh, that's a type two impossibility. In fact, it's a possibility. So um, some of them have been growing in the laboratory to um, uh, multiple uh, to centimeter size. Uh, so it's just a matter of creating enough, you know, enough material and growing things slowly enough. There's nothing that stops in principle from their growing. And their rate of growth is roughly the same as that for crystals of similar compositions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dave Walker. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much for a fabulous talk. That didn't even need music to make it uh, entertaining. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. One of the uh, uh, things that I noticed about the difficulties of field work in a remote place like Kamchatka, besides the bears, is that the samples you collect have to be separated from the roots and the berries and the salmon bones and the bear poop and all the rest of the things that make the target you're looking for somewhat more obscure. And I was wondering if you actually considered looking at lunar soil and breccia samples as having <laughs> all that subset of debris removed from them, they've already been collected for you as a possible target of opportunity for looking for this stuff. Oh, thanks. Uh, well, let's see, let me answer, there's two parts to that question. Uh, we were luckier in terms of what we had to uh, look for because um, for most of the territory that, that we were in, it would be impossible to have looked for any materials because it's covered, it's, you know, it's tundra, it's covered with um, 
uh, with feet of um, dead biological material. However, the stream cuts out, uh, cuts, you know, is cut through that, that material down to the rock level so that you can actually see the layers along the, the, uh, along the stream bed. And you can go into layers which are, you know, well below the surface level. And as I mentioned briefly, you could even bring some of that clay out, which um, uh, has enough biological material in it that you can do carbon dating and date it back to eight to 10,000 years uh, uh, old. And there is the best place to look for pristine material. Uh, and uh, if there was bear poop there, it's long since been fused into the rest of the clay. So it wasn't quite as bad as you say, but we did have to, you still have to pan for it. And because you can't, you know, you have to bring out a pan material that you're going to bring it out of the country. Um, you, you can't bring it along with the biological material. Um, now, uh, yes, we have thought about the moon and Brescia and things like that. Uh, and, and, but, uh, and, and, and so it, it's among the side project projects, but not one that's delivered yet. I guess that's the way I put it. Thank you. It's, 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 a, it's a good suggestion. Okay, Joyce Baum. Hi there, I just wanted to follow up on uh, Rhodes uh, question earlier on the chemistry structure and then Robert's question on the chemistry. Um, I did get the pleasure of working with Paul and Luca and I calculated the density of state for a, an approximate of their decagonal quasi-crystal containing iron, nickel, and aluminum. And there is a preference to um, maximize nickel-aluminum interactions over nickel-nickel. And that um, there's this 3D nickel interaction with the 3P aluminum that seems to be optimized. And then you can also see that in, in some of our publication. But I wanted to follow through with some uh, chemistry involved, but that's all. Thanks for the questions earlier. So is that Thanks, work Joyce. Good to hear from you. Uh, is all that work yeah, I, I should say, I just wanted to make one comment about that, um, which is uh, I had mentioned two of the quasi-crystals, just, just as for historical interest, there were actually three different quasi-crystals found in this meteorite. The two I mentioned, two different icosahedral phases, and the one that Joyce mentioned, a, a so-called decagonal phase. That's a phase which is periodic in one direction and tenfold symmetric in the th third direction, uh, aluminum, um, nickel, uh, aluminum, nickel, copper. And that was the one that she worked with us and analyzed. So uh, yeah, maybe I'll just stop there. Go, go ahead, Russ. I was just wondering if it's published. Uh, that work is published, yes. Very good, okay. Martin, good next. Martin yeah. Rom. Yes, uh, fantastic talk. I have a naive question. Is it possible, or this is another class of impossibilities, to consider the electronic structure of these materials? How would one go about computing uh, quantum mechanically, anything like this, or and are there efforts to do that? Yeah. So, um, so, um, so, in dealing with metallic alloys, uh, as you probably know, um, one of the uh, approaches is to study the density of states. Uh, see if there are in such states uh, pseudo gaps, see if the, if the Fermi level is near the pseudo gap, those tend to, there are so-called Rothery rules that suggest that those are electronically favored. This is related to what uh, Joyce was, somewhat related to what Joyce was, was mentioning. Um, so there, there, there are um, arguments like that that work for some systems and don't work for other quasi-crystal systems. Don't seem to be good enough for other quasi-crystal systems. Um, uh, and um, on a separate line, which is, will sound very different. Uh, so, so part of the frustration is a lot of the tools that we use for studying electronic properties for crystals, we simply can't use that mathematics for quasi-crystals because it, you start by putting in the system in some large periodic box. Um, but as an alternative, one of the things, this is what led me to be thinking about photonics because the propagation of light according to Maxwell's equations through dielectric materials with, um, uh, with very different, composed of different dielectric uh, 
materials. Um, uh, is uh, one of the properties of that is that the equations look a lot like the Schrodinger equation for electrons propagating through a, through a metal. And um, what we have, um, it's propagating through a crystal, I should say. Uh, and uh, so we've done a lot of studies, uh, both physical and computationally for photonics, at, among other things, studying the formation of band gaps, photonic band gaps in these materials, which uh, are interestingly both similar and different from the kinds of band gaps one gets for, for, for crystals. So there is, there is work out there that you can look at along that line as well. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question. There's a, a question from John Bellow. He doesn't have a mic and it concerns nucleation. So he asks, can you please comment on the theoretical underpinnings to the ubiquity of icosahedral phases as opposed to nucleation of the more common close pack structures. And given that icosahedral fluctuations of supercooled liquids occur in simulations, is it known whether the icosahedral phase is the true ground state or a metastable one? I'll stop there. Hmm. Well, several thoughts come to mind. I'm trying to decide which one to go with first. Um, so, you know, historically, I just mentioned my own interest in quasi crystals had to do with the study of the nucleation of sh in a short range order, icosahedral orientational order in supercooled liquids and glasses, uh, work I had done, uh, work I had done uh, before thinking about quasi crystals. And the question, and in a sense, since the history was following the line of reasoning, I think you're suggesting, which is if you see that an and if you see that uh, in your simulations or in your actual physical systems, icosahedral units, icosahedral fluctuations are favored, uh, what is the, at the, what's the limit? How, how big of an icosahedral, how long, how far can this icosahedral extend? That was actually the question that I was trying to answer when we stumbled across the idea of quasi-crystals. I was expecting to compute what's the maximal extent of icosahedral symmetry. And what we actually accidentally found is that when you allow quasi-periodicity, there is no such limit. It's infinitely, it's infinite range of quasi-hedral order. Now, going back to your question, right? If we're going back to the systems I was originally looking at, those were systems which were monodisperse, like simulating argon or something like that. And I think if you only have a single size atom, it seems very hard to make the quasi-hedral fluctuations extensive. We're able to get the icosahedral order to extend roughly on the scale of, let's say, I'll say 10 nearest neighbor distances, but it couldn't extend farther. But I don't know that if you hadn't mixed other combinations of different sizes, that they might not have favored the icosahedral phase to longer and longer distances, ultimately leading to one which would be infinite. We don't have a proof one way or the other on that. That's a, that's a, you know, a kind of hard packing problem, uh, uh, an energetics problem, uh, and is open. Okay, thanks. Another question from Livermore. I believe this is John Eckert. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is John Eckert um, from Livermore. I, I, Hi. Um, so I'm just curious about the connections to some. Uh, some macroscopic crystals that um, Hubert and um, Macmillan have, have published on the B6O, where they see sort of 40 micron crystallites that have very clearly, um, you know, icosahedral um, structures. Um, are those related? They, they claim that they're a rhombohedral space group. Are those connected to, uh, how are those connected to these, these um, Quasi crystals. Um, I confess I don't know. I don't know. I, I should. Back, I, I. I would have to go back and check the papers. Um, uh, but let me. But I suspect, from what you've described, that you're talking about a system in which there are icosahedral clusters, which are rather large. That's right. Yes. Okay. So it goes back to what I was saying. Uh, in, in, regarding this image. So you might think that a good way to make something icosahedral is to 
put together a bunch of icosahedra. <laughs> but you'll find, for the same reasons that that the that people knew 100 plus years ago, that they don't pack crystallographically very well. On the other hand, they tend to be rather spherical uh, units, so they do pack. They tend to pack like crystals, with you know a few intervening atoms in between. If you want to make a quasi-crystal, you have to be able to break them into subunits that break those symmetries. So if you look at the blue units and the yellow units and the white units, those are actually sub pieces of the red units. But, if, but they break the icosahedral symmetry. So I need to have, be able to, it looks like based on our experience, I can't say there's a rigorous proof of this, but in all our experience so far, if you really wanna make something that's extensively quasi-crystal, you don't wanna have something like, you know, um, uh, Buckminster fullerenes or, or boron 60 icosahedral clusters only. You also have to have the kind of clusters you need, which are the right subshapes to fit together to allow the structure to become extensive. Another way of thinking of it is I could, I could also take this structure you're seeing and view it as the icosahedral clusters which are interpenetrating. And interpe so you know, normally when we think of packings, we think of packings edge to edge, but imagine they're allowed to interpenetrate, which in this case would mean to share atoms. So you won't just need something which is icosahedral, you need something which is icosahedral and that can share with itself such as to make doublets and triplets and different arrangements. If you have that, that's the kind of ingredient you need. Those, those overlaps break the symmetry of either of the clusters that form them, although the two clusters, by, if taken apart, I'm sorry, and the two clusters by themselves have the icosahedral symmetry. So those are, I should again emphasize, these are vague geometric I'll say rules of thumb um, that we have gleaned from experience, but these are not things which are proven rigorously. So it's just what we find so far from experience. Thanks. So I, I tried to uh, to to share uh, in the chat the uh, of reference, but I don't know if it succeeded or not. I think it did. Yeah. Right. I think John's referring to, to, to the many boron compounds and boron itself that forms normal crystals, but with icosahedral units. Right. Okay. So that's what I was talking about. Yeah. So normally, yeah. if you just make something icosahedral, whether it's a virus or a Buckminster fullerene or, or, or B60, they, the units will be icosahedral, but they, do, they can't overlap. They can't share. They can't, and they can't be, and there aren't natural units of these sub pieces of them that can form, uh, that can maintain the order, the orientational order and allow them to fit together. So, you know, if you look at those two top icosahedra, uh, two top tiacontahedra, the two red ones, you see the stuff in between those white pieces. It's important that they have that, that shape and not some other shape. And yet, the, which is to say, they, it's important that they're sub pieces of the red things. You can fit them inside. You can take the red thing and divide it into pieces that look like the white ones. Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't have that, you're at, uh, I, 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 no, I, should, I shouldn't have put the sentence that way. The examples we know which are successful are examples like that. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, it's uh, 2.35 here. So thank you for hanging on and taking all these questions. Paul, it was a terrific talk, terrific discussion. Thank you all for attending and thank you for the talk. Thank, thank you. you, thank you all for listening and thanks for all the great questions and, and for your patience. <laughs>